So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Stuart Hameroff, Professor of Anesthesiology and Director of Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona, Arizona at uh, Tucson. He um, has uh, collaborated with Roger Penrose on the um, Orch OR objective, orchestrated objective reduction theory of consciousness. Um, he has appeared in the um, film What the Bleep, and he's currently working on a feature animation called Mindville. So uh, let's welcome Stuart Hameroff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isaac, uh, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. And I'm going to start off talking about consciousness. And uh, we know that when we open our eyes, the world appears before us. And we know that light enters the eyes, goes to the, back, the thalamus and the back of the brain, and then bing, the world appears before us. Now, the word bing has kind of come into use in the consciousness studies uh, area to denote phenomenal subjective experience, otherwise known as the hard problem, what it is like to be something. So if you see bing, that means conscious phenomenal experience. And that's what we're trying to understand. But we know that the world is actually the representation of the world is in our head, or the world we, we experience is a representation in our head. This is what modern science has told us. Not everybody agrees with us, but most people would. Going back to the ancient Greeks, so the being is actually, the representation of the world is in our head, and that, that is conscious experience. But if that's so, then we don't really know what's out there for sure. And Descartes uh, confronted this problem. And, uh, is, and he talked about that we could be a brain in a vat fed information by an evil genius. In recent times, this is the theme of the movie The Matrix. Uh-oh. Uh OK. The, uh, the Matrix, where uh, actually the, the outside world is an illusion. But because of this, uh, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. The only thing he could be sure of is that he was conscious. Descartes gave uh, several other uh, important contributions, including uh, his idea that the contents of consciousness are uh, like the, uh, the players and props on a stage. And uh, this, uh, Dennett called this later the Cartesian theater. So we have uh, various things, uh, uh, script and irony and things going on to the content of the stage that is pr presented to the audience. But who is the audience? Who is perceiving the consciousness? And this, is, of course, goes back to the Bing problem uh, of the phenomenal experience. And uh, if there's a, a film or, or a being shown, who's looking at it? Uh, if there's an observer, then that individual has to has an, have an observer and, and so forth. And this gets into what's called the infinite regress problem of observers all the way down. Descartes believed that uh, the, the audience was an immaterial soul uh, hovering above his body. He was a religious man, and that it was the the soul that had the Bing experience, and that the soul uh, viewed, uh, viewed the contents through the pineal gland, which was the only midline structure that he knew about. So this led to Cartesian dualism, or what's called in modern times cognitive closure or mysterianism, which basically says that we will never be able to understand conscious experience. Steven Pinker, for example, is a cognitive closure uh, aficionado, although he doesn't uh, even uh, uh, pretend to understand the quantum argument, but that's another matter. But anyway, this separates mind and matter. That's dualism, Cartesian dualism. What we do know is that for vision, uh, light enters the eye, uh, signals go from the optic nerve to the thalamus, and they're broadcast to the back of the brain, and then sequentially moving forward uh, from the back of the brain, forward, forward, picking up v, uh, V4, and then frontal cortex. And it seems that for full uh, attention-mediated consciousness that you need the back of the brain and the front of the brain. This is called uh, bottom up or top down if, uh, if there's process going from the, back, from the front of the brain back down. And this, for full attention mediated consciousness, is how conscious experience occurs, or at least is associated with this type of activity in the front and the back of the brain. And there's kind of a snowball effect where in the back of the brain you, you detect shape and then shape and color, shape, color, and motion. And then after several hundred milliseconds, the Bing experience of an integrated visual gestalt. So, the cartoon form would be uh, there's activity in the back and V4 and also the front, and this gives rise to the Bing experience, consciousness, phenomenal experience, front and back. However, other situations of localized activity also give rise to consciousness, so you don't necessarily need the front and the back for, for example, pure color. Zeki did experiments stimulating uh, V4 area, and the uh, subjects had an uh, experience of pure color without any context. So the question is, what type of activity mediates this? Another type of more localized 
conscious experience comes from our lower uh, centers, more primitive centers, the emotional core, uh, intense uh, romantic, shall we say, feelings from the brainstem media by dopamine and other hormones uh, and other neurotransmitters. So some process activity is specific for consciousness. You know, it's not an architecture that you need the front and the back and the front. It's some activity that can occur locally, globally, or regionally. We just don't know what that activity is. There are also representations of the body, uh, the motor homunculus, for example, and the sensory homunculus. Uh, or this is motor over here, and they're proportional to the sensitivity in the case of uh, sensory or the need for fine control in the case of motor. So this is how our bodies are represented in our cortex. So here's a little cartoon of what a homunculus might look like if he or she were talking to you. And uh, the, the brains will be performing um, at our next consciousness conference. We also know that memory and conscious content are distributed throughout the cortex in a sort of a holographic fashion. And Carl Prebrum uh, talks about this, and this goes back to Lashley. We know that memory is not stored in any one place, and probably conscious content is not represented in any one place, but is stored kind of all over the, the place in many situations in a distributed hologram-like way. OK, so how do we put this all together? Uh, Early AI guys, uh, Simon and Newell and others, uh, had the idea of a blackboard, which became the global workspace, uh, where you, you put down the content of, of the moment and what's going on. So you have inputs, you have top-down effects, logic, various things go into the global workspace, which produces an out output uh, in a computer architecture. This is very much like the Cartesian theater. In fact, this was basically adapted from the Cartesian theater idea by Bernie Bars. As far as putting it on, on structures in the brain, Bars and Dehane and others came up with the idea that uh, the thalamus projection to the cortex and then back to the thalamus gave rise to these uh, top bottom-up and top-down feedback and feed-forward loops that give rise that, that constitute the global workspace. So kind of the, the uh, party line in modern neuroscience and, and cognitive science is that you have a global workspace that may be the thalamus talking to the cortex or the front of the cortex talking to the back of the cortex. Uh, with emotions, memory putting it, uh, going in, that somehow gives rise to consciousness as an emergent output of this computation. So in a more simplistic form, it would be uh, <clears throat> bottom up and top down, and consciousness kind of uh, emerges in some way in between. Uh, Ray Jackendoff, a philosopher uh, several decades ago, and also Jeffrey Gray and some other people recently, have noted that consciousness is probably not at the bottom, not at the top, but in the middle, in an intermediate uh, setting, wh which, uh, which kind of has a handshake with both bottom up and top down. And that consciousness is in an intermediate uh, situation uh, between inputs and uh, between the bottom and the top. But it could also be, be argued that this, this happens uh, many places in this cognitive hierarchy um, in the cortex or between thalamus and cortex. Now, what about the brain? <clears throat> How do we put this into, into biological brains? <clears throat> well, Ramon y Cajal, a famous Spanish neuroanatomist, uh, uh, the turn of the century, last, last turn of the century, uh, 100 years ago, showed that the brain is composed of individual cells called neurons. Now, prior to this time, Golgi, the uh, pr predominant uh, Italian neuroanatomist, was saying that the brain was a syncytium, was kind of a tangled, threaded reticulum of fibers that uh, weren't, weren't separated, weren't distinct. But uh, um, Cajal demonstrated synapses between neurons, showing that neurons were discrete entities, although with very complex and beautiful forms. Now, with gap junctions, and as I'll get to in a minute, it looks like there actually are syncytium also mediated by gap junctions. But Cajal showed that the brain was composed of individual cells called neurons connected by synapses mediated by uh, chemical neurotransmitters that transmitted information. So uh, with this type of neuron, this is, this is what you get. These, these are toy neurons with, say, three dendrites that receive the input, one axon that spikes. And if you put a bunch of them together in a network or a loop, you get uh, information, a signal that travels around the loop. Now, no, notice these signals are not coherent. Uh, wherever you happen to measure, it, when, they, when the spike passes by, you will see a, a voltage potential. So um, computer people then came back and, and uh, made a model neuron. McCullough and Pitts in 1943 uh, made the first artificial neuron or model neuron in a paper called A Logical Calculus of Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity. And basically, they had inputs a neurode, which uh, plays the role of biological neurons, and an output. So these became dendrites, and this became the axon, 
with spikes, uh, outgoing spikes or firings. Now, if you add uh, connection strengths, uh, which, can be, uh, which can be altered uh, synaptic plasticity due to Hebbian learning, Donald Hebb's contribution in the late 1940s of adjustable uh, connection strengths, um, this led to the perceptron, which was the first, uh, which was put forth by Rosenblatt in 1962, which eventually led to neural networks some 20 years later. Uh, Marvin Minsky wrote a very critical paper, and this, this idea disappeared for about 20 years, but then came back and led to artificial neural networks. So this is basically the, the McCullough-Pitts neuron with, with a variable connection strengths. And if you make a network of these in, um, in artificial neurons, uh, it will self-learn and, and, and learn to recognize patterns. So artificial neural networks uh, came back in the 1980s or so based on, uh, on variable connect connection strengths, inputs, and outputs. And this looked, this was basically based on neural networks, so how people understood neural networks, and also helped, under, helped explain how neural networks might work. Now, the biology of this is based on here's a neuron with many dendrites in a cell body and one axon, which then branches and goes to other, um, in this case, one, but actually many other different nerve cells. And the message transfer, uh, the information transfer, is due to uh, a propagating spike, a depolarization mediated by ions traveling uh, across the membrane perpendicular to the flow of the spike, uh, propagating as a, as a firing, axon firing or spike along the long axon. Now, the science for this was based on the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. Uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations in 1952 related the membrane potential to ionic currents moving through these ion channels here and uh, accounts for nonlinear triggering of the action potentials or spikes. And it allowed uh, people to model the neuron as a series of capacitors and with resistances and so forth, which led to various types of models uh, of dendrites as cable theory and, and so forth. I'll, and this is much better than uh, just simply summating inputs, but still doesn't do justice to the complexity of dendritic processing. So in a very rough sense, neural networks can be thought of as something like this, this type of feed-forward biological neuronal network, with the exception that these spikes would only, wouldn't only go to one neuron, they, would go to, they might branch and go to other neurons as well. But basically, the artificial neural network fits with the idea of a feed-forward biological neuronal network as shown with these toy neurons. So stepping back for a second, this, the idea that consciousness emerges from this type of computation is basically materialism, representationalism, computationalism, AI, uh, brain equals mind equals computer, emergence theory, and the singularity, all materialism, the idea that matter gives rise to mind. So the singularity specifically uh, is, a, is a, I guess, a group of notions which says that computers will reach or surpass human brain computational capacity based on extrapolation of Moore's law, and I'm sure you all know what Moore's law is, so that human brain functions, including consciousness, will, in, will occur in computers. This is the, the core idea of uh, the singularity. Now, ignoring consciousness for a moment, let's just look at the human brain computational capacity, because I will argue that computation does not necessarily lead to, to consciousness. But just look at the computational capacity. AI assumptions based on neuronal firings and synaptic transmissions, that is, neurocomputation, based on Moravec and Ray Kurzweil and others, roughly you have 10 to the 11th neurons per brain, roughly 1,000 synapses per neuron firing maybe 100 times per second gives you very roughly 10 to the 16th operations per second. So they plot out when Moore's law reaches uh, 10 to the 16th operations per second. It's another 10 or however many years, and then consciousness will happen. That's the prediction, the assumption of the singularity. So let's, what are the problems with this? Well, one is that it assumes consciousness is an output of neuronal computation in these feedforward and feedback networks. And this requires consciousness to be epiphenomenal and illusory. I'm not going to go into this, uh, uh, take the time to go into this, but if you measure the evoked potentials that fit this model, the activity correlating with conscious, consciousness uh, in, in any type of paradigm occurs several hundred milliseconds after uh, the stimulus, and we've already responded even in rapid conversation and ping pong and baseball, we've already responded and we think we're acting consciously, but the science says, no, you're at, we're acting unconsciously and, and falsely believe we're acting consciously. Uh, therefore, consciousness is an epiphenomenon and an illusion. And I'll come back to this later. But it assumes neuronal firings or synaptic transmissions are the fundamental information states or bits. If we go down a level into the cytoskeleton of the microtubules, we'll see that we gain roughly 12 orders of magnitude greater than the singularity assumption. 
that which may or may not be a problem. Now, to show uh, why it's wrong to consider neuronal firings and synapses as the fundamental units of information, consider a single cell organism like a paramecium. This is one cell. It has no synapses, no, no spikes. It swims around. It finds food. It finds mates. It avoids obstacles. It learns if you suck it into a capillary tube, it gets out faster and faster each time. It has sex. Here's a, a, paired, uh, uh, a pair of uh, paramecium conjugating. And it does so without any synapses. It uses its microtubules, which including the microtubules in the cilia on its outside, which are both sensory and motor, and the microtubules inside the cell. And these same microtubules are found in neurons. If we look through one of those cilia that are both sensory uh, organs and also motor organs in a paramecium and look inside, we see that it's, it's made up of these uh, doublets of structures called microtubules, which uh, by these other contractile pro proteins bend and can send signals back uh, into the cell itself. And these same microtubules are found in other structures uh, widely throughout our biology. For example, uh, in, our, in our eyes, the uh, sensory cilia in the retina, uh, light passes through these to get to the rhodopsin in the, in the back of the rods and cones. And these things are very well uh, structured to be uh, optical detectors and, and photoreceptors, and have been shown to be photoreceptors in organisms like euglena and other uh, cells by Gunter Albrecht Bueller. And a pair of these structures make up centrioles, which have a very important role in cell division. When the chromosomes divide, it's the centrioles shown here in the yellow connected to microtubules here that pull the chromosomes apart. This is the activity that first got me obsessed, interested and obsessed with microtubules some 35 years ago. And it's still a mystery how this uh, beautiful orchestrated mitosis occurs. In neurons, if you look inside neurons, um, you see microtubules also shown here. Uh, you can, the, the tops have been ripped off in the preparation to show that they're hollow. And they're connected by other proteins to form a network, which I will argue is a computational network occurring inside each and every neuron in the brain. Uh, I got interested in this in the 70s and 80s and, and uh, worked with a physicist at Los Alamos named St Steen Rasmussen. And we modeled microtubules as cellular automata in which the state of each individual subunit, so here's a microtubule. It's made up of these peanut-shaped proteins called tubulin, which can change shapes governed by uh, quantum forces inside, inside uh, their interiors. And we, we modeled them as a computational lattice and calculated their forces, their, their interaction forces, so that much like a cellular automata, we see patterns and gliders and computation occurring in microtubules based on the, the, uh, individual, the state of each individual subunit being the fundamental bit or unit of information uh, in biology. So you, if you take a piece of a microtubule and the, and the white and the blue being different patterns, and this is just based on dipole-dipole coupling forces among the six surrounding neighbors, and because of the hexagonal skewed lattice, you get some interesting behaviors and propagation of patterns and information. And if you couple a couple of these together, you can show learning, and we did that in some simulation studies. So the inside of a neuron would actually look something like this, uh, where here's the, the receptors on the dendritic spines. There's actin filaments connecting to the microtubules, which are linked to other microtubules. So you have a computational lattice inside the dendrites of each uh, neuron in the brain, in fact, all of our cells. But dendrites have particularly uh, elaborate and, and well-organized uh, microtubule networks. And are microtubules important in our brain? Yes, if they get messed up, we get what's called neurofibrillary tangles, which is one of the, the hallmark features of Alzheimer's disease. Everybody talks about the amyloid plaques on the outside, but the other uh, essential lesion to get Alzheimer's disease is that the microtubules inside the neurons get all tangled uh, due to a defect in the tau protein, which, which keeps them uh, from falling apart. And so your microtubules disintegrate if you have Alzheimer's disease. So let's say this is correct, that there's, there's computation going on at the level of the microtubules inside uh, the neurons. Uh, what does that make the computational capacity of the human brain? Well, each neuron has about 10 to the 8th microtubule subunits, which switch states in the nanosecond. So that gives you about 10 to the 17th operations per second per neuron, which is more than the singularity is projecting to the entire brain. So that's a problem. So if you count each neuron, it gives you about 10 to the 28th operations per second. So the goalpost for the sing singularity should be pushed back another 12 orders of magnitude, which would definitely get you into the quantum regime. But whether that's a problem or not, uh, we don't know yet. So uh, another problem with the neurocomputational singularity concept 
is that the neuronal behavior deviates from Hodgkin-Huxley. Remember, Hodgkin-Huxley is, is what makes neurons act like model neurons. And we now know that ion channels appear to require non-local co cooperative interactions for spiking, for spike firing, and there's an X factor affecting spike threshold. Uh, a paper in uh, 2000, and, actually 2006 in Nature by Nondorf et al. Uh, these, are the, these are spikes. The reds are the spikes. This is the activity in the dendrites of the cell body, and this is the emergence of spikes, which is, this is what Hodgkin-Huxley predicts here. There is a gradual increase in the, in the uh, voltage, and it reaches a threshold, and then there's kind of a, a sloping uh, uh, uptake, and spiking occurs with a very narrow threshold. But what cortical neurons do is this. And this doesn't hold true for, it holds true less for neurons in slice and not at all for model neurons, is that, number one, there's a very wide threshold. There's a great variability in what's going to uh, trigger a spike in every neuron from, from spike to spike. And some people say it's noise, but it's, it's probably something going on buried in this uh, gray uh, electron activity cloud, which correlates among neurons, even uh, across the brain. And uh, also, the, the, up, the uptake, the slope, is almost vertical, basically vertical, which means that if you, look at, if you think about it, what, what Hodgkin Huxley says was that a wave of depolarization is going to move, and as it hits this, this channel and this channel, the channels open sequentially as the wave moves along. But that's not what happens. What happens is that the channels open uh, in a given region, triggering the spike, open simultaneously. They all open at the same time. And uh, Gustav Bernreuter and others have suggested that there's uh, quantum coherence occurring among, these, uh, among the channels to give rise to this spike. So neurons in the brain do not behave the way model neurons do. They have this, this X factor, and also they seem to require quantum cooperativity to give the robustness of the spike. Another problem with, um, with the uh, neurocomputation, gamma, uh, neurocomputation singularity idea is gamma synchrony EEG, the best measurable correlate of consciousness. This used to be known as coherent 40 hertz. It was discovered in the 1980s that uh, cog high order cognition and consciousness uh, has, a, has a high frequency e EEG component, 30 to 90 hertz, above what's, what's usually measured. And uh, this goes away with anesthesia and comes back when the patient wakes up. And it's not related to axonal firings or spikes. It's mediated through gap junction connected dendrites in structures that uh, we're calling hyperneurons or dendritic webs. So uh, here's, our, here's a brain, uh, somebody being, uh, with their EEG being recorded. And the normal EEG frequencies that we usually think about, alpha, beta, and so forth, uh, go to 30. And then above 30 is gamma. And filters tend to cut this off because it gets in a muscle artifact. And, and power, uh, electrical power and so forth. But, but controlling for that, people, uh, of many people have found that the best correlate of consciousness is correlations between like front and back, right to left, uh, gamma synchrony being precisely uh, synchronized. For example, Lutz and all did a study on uh, Buddhist meditating uh, monks who've been uh, meditating for decades and decades. And their controls were college kids who were just taught to meditate for a couple days. And they measured their gamma synchrony. And the monks had incredibly robust, highly coherent gamma synchrony, very high frequency too, out to about 80 or 90, whereas the college kids had some gamma synchrony, but it wasn't nearly as robustly coherent or as synchronous. And the monks had a much better, much higher, uh, highly, more highly coherent gamma synchrony even without meditating, showing that years of meditation changes the brain. Uh, another study on this was done by uh, Frank Eckenhofer in the Amazon, where he uh, went down and studied uh, uh, <clears throat> subjects taking ayahuasca and measured their EEG. And he, he avoided the, uh, he just looked at the top of the brain to avoid muscle uh, artifact. And he found tremendous correlations uh, from side to side, front to back, in the gamma synchrony in subject compared to controls in subjects uh, taking ayahuasca, the hallucinogenic brew uh, used by shamans in the Amazon. And this is what apparently they see under ayahuasca. This is paintings done by this shaman, Pablo Amaringo, the visions that are seen with ayahuasca. So uh, when they're seeing this, their brains are highly coherent at, in the gamma synchrony range. But gamma synchrony cannot be easily explained by uh, this axonal dendritic neurocomputational paradigm. It requires a different type of connection from chemical synapses. So here's a, a normal chemical, chemical synapse, neurotransmitter synapse, incoming axon, a space, the synapse, a spine, and then the postsynaptic dendrites. 
But there's another type of connection called a gap junction, be, for example, between dendrites. So here's a dendrite of one cell, a dendrite of another cell, and there's this gap junction, which is like a window between the cells. Now this couples these two membranes coherently, so they, they depolarize synchronously, but it also makes the interior of one cell the, uh, equivalent to the interior of the other cell. Basically makes it like a, a syncytium, uh, as Golgi suggested before Cajal. It is this type of connection, the gap junction connection, shown here, and these are much bigger than ion channels, plus they connect to uh, pores on the other side. So if you were swimming around in this cell, you could swim through this gap junction into another cell. So this is what mediates gamma synchrony. From the inside of a cell, say from the inside of one uh, dendrite, look, it might look like this. Here are the microtubules, here's the gap junction of the other cell, and then here's a, uh, <clears throat> an axon and a synapse here. So this is where I think consciousness is happening. This is where, this is, what is being uh, active, this is what is mediating gamma synchrony. Now this, this type of, of network would look completely different than the net network we saw before, but is, is actually embedded in the other type of network. So here's a bunch of toy neurons and glia, because glia also have gap junctions, connected by these dendritic-dendritic gap junctions, and they are uh, depolarizing coherently. So it's kind of like a chorus line where the dancers are, are holding hands and acting coherently, And because if you measure anywhere in this, in this area, you're going to get this the synchronous activity that is synchronized from here to here, here to here. And this is the type of dendritic uh, postsynaptic uh, potentials which are synchronized. Spikes are not synchronized. When, when gamma synchrony came along, people who, uh, people assumed spikes were coherent, they jumped on the bandwagon, proclaimed it as the neural correlate of consciousness, but that when it came out later that spikes are not coherent, uh, many people were forced to choose between spikes and gamma synchrony, and they chose spikes incorrectly, I would say. So this is where I think Bing is happening in the gamma synchrony. This doesn't tell you why Bing is happening. So, um, and these are embedded in the uh, other type of uh, feed forward and feedback neural, neural networks. So there's no new anatomy here. It's just the same old anatomy, just taking into account these types of connections. And in fact, this does occur in the brain. Here's a pyramidal cell neuron. These are all dendrites. Here's the one axon coming down here. Uh, and it has these lateral connections with other dendrites. And this is shown beautifully here in the slide from Cajal of the lateral uh, basilar uh, dendrites of pyramidal cells interacting. So this type of layer may be where, where consciousness is occurring. And uh, these have been called uh, <clears throat> dendritic webs or hyperneurons. So I have a simulation here. Let's see if this is going to work. Just takes a second. This is done by a guy named Rob Stufflebean of the of the Mind Project, and it's it's showing a couple of things. Never don't worry about the sound. It's showing uh, this type of connection, which is the chemical synapse, and then here's the here's the dendritic dendritic gap junction. It takes a few minutes. So, so the point is that that these two dendrites, these two cells mediated by gap junctions, depolarize synchronously. It's not a domino effect like with axonal spikes. Uh, neurons connected by these guys depolarize synchronously uh, together. So in the context of, of uh, this, this sounds a little bit annoying, but you see the axonal spikes that look like uh, these traveling signals going on. But in the background, you get this green flashing. That would be something like the dendritic uh, gamma synchrony. So it's going on underneath or behind or supporting the axonal spikes that everybody uh, normally pays attention to. So just to recapitulate, this is the type of circuit that I think is mediating consciousness, dendritic, dendritic uh, gap junction networks with, with uh, processing and microtubules going out with, that happen to be quantum computations going on inside that mediate uh, consciousness. So the last uh, problem I have with neurocomputation singularity is that uh, psychoactive drugs, including anesthesia, which blocks consciousness selectively, and psychoactive drugs, which, which enhance consciousness, if you will, uh, act via quantum interactions in dendritic proteins, membrane proteins and microtubules. Uh, anesthesia doesn't do anything to spikes. It just affects dendrites, for example. And all the psychoactive drugs act on, uh, act on dendritic uh, proteins. 
They're mediated by quantum interactions called van der Waals forces, shown here between two neutral neon atoms, where the electrons of the, of the one atom repel the electrons in the other, forming temporary dipoles. The temporary dipoles then interact. These are not chemical bonds. These are physical quantum interactions and are what mediate uh, uh, effects of psychoactive drugs, anesthetics, and protein conformational states of some proteins. So proteins are chains of amino acids, and they fold when these nonpolar groups, including the, uh, those with aromatic rings, uh, get together in, in the interior, form what are called hydrophobic pockets or quantum pockets, which can mediate the conformational state of the protein. So here's a protein with two different conformations. And uh, certain proteins, I, I'm calling them Schrodinger's proteins, like for uh, the, uh, the quantum guy, um, because they're like Schrodinger's cat. They can, um, the electrons, the quantum interactions, control the state of the protein. And anesthetic gases get into these pockets and just acting purely by quantum interactions without any chemical forces, block consciousness selectively. The rest of the brain is quite active. There's EEG continues except for gamma. There's evoked potentials. The only thing that's missing is gamma synchrony and consciousness and acting strictly by quantum interactions. And I have a paper about this in, in anesthesiology that's on my website. So um, tubulin, the microtubule subunit, is such a protein. It has a large uh, nonpolar uh, hydrophobic pocket made of these aromatic rings. So we've modeled it as a, as a switch. So if the electrons are in this direction, it's in this state. If they're in this direction, it's in this state. And they go back and forth between the two states, something like that. OK, so where's the bing? So let's say I'm right that, that uh, computation goes down to the level of tubulin subunits inside neurons. You have 10 to the 28th operations per second. How does that explain consciousness? Good question. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But just to be complete here, we've talked about dualism. We've talked about materialism. Another possibility is idealism, that mind generates matter. Uh, Bishop Barclay, actually Aristotle had something about this, that we project mental qualities onto the world. And of course, uh, Indian uh, mystics, uh, uh, idealistic, would say that uh, ment mentation creates the world around them. So idealism is another possibility. But let's say we don't like that. We don't like materialism. We don't like dualism. Um, there's another possibility called neutral monism that was put forth by Spinoza, then William James, Bertrand Russell, that there's some underlying something that, uh, that gives rise in one situation to matter and one situation to mind. And I like this one. And we'll come back to that in a second. So here's uh, an anesthetic sensitive uh, Schrodinger's protein. But because these are quantum interactions mediating its conformational state, that means it should also be in quantum superposition of both states at the same time. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, these proteins can act like a quantum bit or qubit in a quantum computer. And the same, the same type of electron resonance activity in these aromatic rings they're called, for example, tryptophan and uh, phenylalanine and so forth, also govern the activity of psychoactive drugs. And I'll come back to that in a second. But the model that Penrose and I developed basically uh, takes a microtubule and says each of these subunits is a qubit, and the microtubules are quantum computers. And this type of quantum interaction uh, may be required for uh, brain-wide gamma synchrony, according to Freeman and Vitiello, who show that there's really no other explanation for front to back, left to right gamma synchrony than, than some kind of quantum long-range dipole correlation mediated by quantum interactions uh, between the proteins. So the psychoactive drugs all have, uh, all have aromatic rings, um, much like uh, uh, the, the hydrophobic pockets. And uh, they're, they're complex, uh, highly aromatic, non-localized rings. So again, uh, back to this, uh, what I'm saying is quantum interaction. And the quantum interactions, say, in this neuron can spread by tunneling uh, to the next neuron, the next neuron, the next neuron. And perhaps through the whole brain by these uh, gap junction mediated uh, hyperneurons. OK, well, where's the bing? Uh, Roger Penrose uh, came up with the idea that consciousness is linked to quantum gravity, uh, that is, fundamental space-time geometry. And when he first came up with this in 1989, people, it was like he was from another universe or something. What the hell is he talking about? And uh, I, at this point, I had been working on microtubule information processing for 20 years, and people kept saying, essentially, well, where's the bing? How does that explain consciousness? So I read his book, and I thought he had some, some very interesting ideas. He basically said that quantum superpositions, which avoid decoherence, grow to meet threshold given by the indeterminacy principle, undergo spontaneous self-collapse. 
uh, objective reduction, a fundamental moment of consciousness, and the consciousness is a sequence of these types of quantum state reductions. This is very much like Alfred North Whitehead's occasions of experience, and Henry Stapp has a, a somewhat comparable idea. So basically, we go back to the idea that a tubulin is a qubit uh, and flips between two states and can be in a superposition of both and uh, um, interacts with others. And the gray tubulins here are those in quantum superposition. They grow and evolve and eventually reach threshold between step six and seven. And this has an uh, objective reduction. And by Penrose definition, this is a moment of consciousness here. Um, now, applying this to the brain at large for gamma synchrony, since we're using E equals H over T, if we set T equal to 25 milliseconds for 40 hertz gamma synchrony, this requires quantum superposition of uh, tubulins and roughly 100,000 neurons. So this uh, dendritic web would change topology because gap junctions can open, close, and change uh, with every uh, conscious moment. So the basic idea is that we have over 25 milliseconds of buildup of a pre-conscious quantum superposition, reaches threshold for now a conscious moment, and that's a moment of consciousness. And a sequence of, of these uh, would look like this. Quantum information can go backward in time to avoid the epiphenomenal problem. And consciousness is a sequence of, uh, of these uh, individual moments, which are actually uh, rooted in quantum mechanics. Um, so what does it mean that something can be in two states at the same time? In addition to, uh, to dealing with the problem of superposition, Roger addressed what it means for something to be in two states at once. And you know the multiple worlds hypothesis that says that every time there's a superposition, uh, space-time separates and forms two, uh, another universe, a separate universe. Well, Penrose starts off by saying the same thing. If we have a, a cartoon here of, of, uh, of sp space uh, condensed down to one dimension and time, so uh, an object, a state in one state would be, say, into the screen, and in another state, another position, out from the screen. And a superposition is a separation, or a bubble, or a, a ripple, if you will, in fundamental space-time geometry. But unlike uh, multiple worlds, which would branch off and form a new universe, the separations are unstable. And after time t given by this equation will self-collapse to one or the other, and a fundamental unit of conscious experience occurs. That was uh, the Penrose, basically the Penrose idea of how consciousness actually happens. So the, if you put it in the context of, <clears throat> of uh, neutral monism and replace uh, underlying something, and Spinoza thought this underlying something was God, but if you say it's quantum space-time, if a measurement or decoherence occurs, you have uh, matter. If objective reduction occurs, you have matter, actually matter and mind, both over here. So this gives an ontology that can explain the hard problem of subjective phenomenal experience. So basically, if she's looking at the rose, and yes, there's a, there's a pattern of activity in the brain, but the reason she has the qualia, the experience of redness, is that the spa particular space-time geometry that, that correlates with redness is being reproduced in her brain. This is uh, pan-experientialism or pan-protopsychism applied to, uh, to modern physics. Now, what, do, what does space-time actually look like? It, uh, it's obviously, uh, we don't know for sure. It's at the Planck scale. Uh, it's approachable through string theory, quantum gravity, twister theory. We don't really know, but it looks something like this. And string theory and loop quantum gravity give sort of similar ideas. And Penrose and uh, a number of people, uh, Freeman Dyson, that should be, David Bohm, have said that precursors of consciousness may be irreducibly embedded at this level, as well as platonic values, may be irreducibly embedded at this level, like mass, spin, or charge. And this is consistent with uh, base, uh, various uh, spiritual beliefs that there's some underlying giant lookup table in the universe, if you will, that, can access, that we can access. OK, so you might say, well, that sounds interesting. And, uh, but, but the brain's too warm. Everybody knows the brain's too warm for quantum computation. To make a quantum computer in the, brain, in the lab, you've got to go to absolute zero and no vibrations and blah, blah, blah. Well, um, I don't think that's true, but let, let's deal with some of the arguments. Max Tegmark published a paper uh, criticizing our theory based on this equation where he calculated a decoherence time of solitons on microtubules 10 to the minus 13 seconds, way too fast to be of any use. But he omitted all of these uh, caveats and stipulations we had put in for our model, and we, uh, we recalculated, uh, Hagen and, and Tusinski and myself, in the same journal he published, and got uh, down to 100 milliseconds or longer for, uh, based on theory. And the, the uh, characteristics that microtubules have that can protect it are 
they have these charged tails that stick out in every tubule, forming a, a plasma, uh, a the bilayer plasma uh, uh, shielding or cloaking microtubules. And also the quantum London forces are, are inside the tubule and protected from the, the environment. And the microtubules can be embedded by actin gel which also isolates, it, isolates from the environment. So microtubules seem to uh, have, have these possible mechanisms, as well as that the, Fibon the Fibonacci pattern uh, of the lattice of the winding patterns uh, may be ideally designed for topological quantum error, error correction, which could extend the, the quantum lifetimes indefinitely. And here's various patterns. You use the Aharon or Bohm effect to follow different patterns, and you get a very, very robust qubit. So the idea is that these patterns would be the qubits rather than each individual tubulin. So if one tubulin gets knocked out of, uh, knocked out of coherence, it uh, gets pulled back in by, by the others. Theory is nice, but what about evidence? Well, in a beautiful paper uh, in last spring in Nature, Engel et al. Uh, found evidence for wave, this is the title of their uh, paper, evidence for wave-like energy transfer through quantum coherence and photosynthesis. And here's a photosynthesis uh, apparatus. Inside the gray is the chlorophyll, and the yellow is a protein scaffolding holding the chlorophyll. And they found clear evidence for quantum coherence in this protein scaffolding surrounding the chlorophyll in photosynthesis at significant warm temperatures. So photosynthesis is using quantum coherence to make the food we eat. So it seems logical that the brain might do something similar. To, for information processing. And also, Uyang and Aushalom in 2003 studied an interesting system of quantum dots in the green and the red connected by these same aromatic rings that we found, find inside uh, proteins and make up uh, psychedelic uh, drugs and so forth. And they found quantum superposition uh, of quantum spin transfer between these, the dots connected by these benzene rings. And as far as temperature, they found that as they increased the temperature from zero degrees at about 80 degrees Kelvin, they got this, this jump in spin transfer efficiency that persisted out to brain temperature. So it's not true that, that, uh, that heat is necessarily the, the enemy of quantum coherence in a biological system. The biology may be using the energy to pump coherence like a laser. A laser is a, is a warm uh, quantum device also. So conclusions. Um, Brain processes underlying consciousness extend downward to computation in microtubules within neuronal dendrites. I think it's very naive to think that a spike is the fundamental unit of information. If you think that's the case, then please explain how paramecium can learn, find food, find mates, have a sex life uh, without any synapses. Um, gamma EEG synchronized dendritic input integration layers, what we're calling hyperneurons or dendritic webs, are the functional neuronal network architecture for consciousness. Uh, these are part and parcel of the uh, uh, feed-forward, feedback uh, neuronal networks that we're all accustomed to looking at. They're just, uh, you just connect the input layers, basically. You make the input layers um, laterally connected, and that's a whole new area for computation, which gives rise to consciousness. The result of those computations can trigger spikes and, and have uh, responses. Quantum computations in these dendritic web microtubules are coupled to gamma synchrony EEG by Penrose objective reduction. So you have the self-collapse after 25 milliseconds, and that's what causes the, the uh, terminates the, uh, the computation and can initiate spikes. And finally, consciousness is a, to, to solve the hard problem, um, to solve the problem of phenomenal experience, I think you have to say that consciousness is a process in fundamental space-time geometry coupled to brain function. And uh, I have uh, explanations for all this um, on my website. So just to conclude, let me just say that, that uh, Penrose suggested that the platonic information embedded in the Planck scale geometry pervades the universe. This is platonic information in terms of mathematical truth and, and other information. And it's accessible to our conscious processes. And the only thing comparable to that I could think of was Google. <laughs> So I'll close and with a uh, plug for the, uh, the, the conference we have every two years in Tucson coming up this coming April. This one should be a particularly good one. And uh, I hope you all come. Thanks a lot for your attention. I don't know whether uh, all animals would be conscious, but you could ask the same question. Well, the, uh, 
the skin, uh, the skin cells in my butt have microtubules. Why isn't my butt conscious? I've had the same question posed to me. And, and, and the, the answer is that, that you need, uh, that, that anything will have a conscious moment if it avoids decoherence and, and by e, e equals h over t. A single electron in superposition isolated from decoherence would have a conscious moment, but only after 10 million years. So the microtubules in your skin cell or some other tissue Number one, it would have to have the, the apparatus to avoid decoherence, the actin gel and all the other things, which it may not have. But even if it did, uh, it, would, it would have to uh, take a long, long time, and probably something would happen in between. So only in the brain do you have, say, 100,000 neurons, the microtubules and 100,000 neurons in superposition so that the self-collapse can occur in 25 milliseconds. Well, how could you tell the the reports that memory is stored long-term instead of a Prion, uh, protein uh, change. Uh, well, I think, I think long-term memory is stored in the cytoskeleton. In the microtubules, in the neurofilaments, which are very, very stable, they're, they're embedded in, 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 amongst the uh, microtubules and other structures. There's no good explanation. I mean, if you say memory is, is, uh, is recorded in the plasticity of a given synapse, the synaptic receptors turn over from hours to days. And that's all regulated by the microtubules. So I think memory uh, has to be, um, and it's been shown that it, in learning paradigms, the dendritic architecture mediated by the microtubules inside the dendrites changes. So uh, memory, I would say, is, is, is stored in the cytoskeleton, microtubules, and neurofilaments. Um, so generally, consciousness is thought of as something that's either there or not. Yes. But if you're attributing consciousness to this like, quantum collapse that happens periodically, um, does that mean that consciousness is a relative thing? Like, the more frequently you have these collapses, the more conscious you are? Uh, both. Both. I would say if you don't have the self-collapse, there's no consciousness. So a computer can have a gazillion switches and bits. If it doesn't have this collapse, it'll never ever be conscious. An electron could have a conscious moment after 10 million years, but the E equals, is also equal to the intensity, so the intensity would be extremely low. So uh, as E becomes greater, Say in our human brains, we've evolved, you know, to have 100,000 uh, tubul uh, tubulins and 100,000 neurons in superposition to reach uh, threshold fast enough to have 40 or 80, in, 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 if you're a meditator or whatever, per second. So not only are you having more conscious moments per second, the intensity is greater. So more intense and more frequent. And more frequent relates to, you know, if you're if if you're in a car accident, the car is spinning, everything slows down. Well, maybe you're having more conscious moments per time plus a higher slope, so more intense. Somebody asked Michael Jordan how he could be so good in basketball. He said, well, the other team's in slow motion when I'm playing well. Maybe he's having more conscious moments per time than the defense. So um, it's, it, it is discrete. It's a, you have to have E equals H over T. If you don't have that, then you're not conscious. But it's, it's like a photon. You can have a low energy photon or a high, high energy photon. So a high, a high energy conscious moment would be uh, high T, sorry, high E, brief T. And a low intensity would be the opposite. By that same logic, um, what happens when you integrate over all of the electrons in the universe that are having this low intensity conscious moment every 10 million years? Well, they would have to be in superposition isolated from the environment. So uh, uh, it's unclear that if you're asked, I don't think, I mean, Henry Stapp says the universe is, is, uh, is his wave function. But I don't think that works. You have to, you have, to isol have isolated uh, superposition. I'm, maybe I'm not understanding your question. OK. Uh, you mentioned that Kurzweil is basically vastly underestimating the complexity of the brain. Yeah. And therefore, even with exponential growth, it would be way further out. Yeah. But is, if we wait long enough, since exponential you know, catches up pretty quickly, is it possible that we ever catch up? I think, well, if you go another 12 orders of magnitude, you're definitely going to get down into the, into the quantum regime. Um, but I don't think that would do it. I think if you need this objective reduction, then you need to have superposition mass. And if you do it with, an elect with a, a, com a silicon computer where the, let's say the, the states are, uh, are in electrons, electron, the mass is so low that it would take nearly forever to reach threshold. You just have a lot of electrons. I think the only way to have a conscious computer technologically would be something like fullerene technology. Because fullerene, if you could somehow make nanotubes into computers, uh, in superposition, 
you have significant mass there. It's still a lot less than proteins, but you can make up for that in other ways. So I think if this idea is right, the only possible quantum computer that would become conscious, I mean, even a regular quantum computer wouldn't become conscious. I think you would need something where the ma there's significant mass and superposition, possibly using fullerene technology. So I feel like you made an incredibly compelling case for why quantum interactions produce the complexity in the mind necessary. It's not just complexity. Because, I mean, a toothache is not complex. It's intense, but I, I don't think it's just complexity, because there are a lot of complex things that aren't, necessarily, aren't conscious. Sure. But I, I, guess, I guess my fundamental level of perhaps this is not a simple question, but I, don't, I, I understand why perhaps the uh, complexity given by quantum, is, uh, quantum interactions are necessary for consciousness, or allow for consciousness, but why quantum is absolutely necessary for consciousness. Because I think the, what gives you consciousness is this self-collapse, according to the Penrose model. I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm biting the ontological bullet. Because if you say that if you have a critical level of complexity is conscious, well, somebody will say, well, there's a, here's a system that has equal complexity. How come that isn't conscious? Or, or, or are you saying it's conscious? I'm saying if you have this type of collapse, it's going to be conscious. I have to bite the ontological bullet and say, well, if an electron is in superposition, it'll have a conscious moment, but only after 10 million years. The brain is, is, uh, is evolved so that we can have a large system in superposition isolated from the environment that mediates information that's connected to inputs and outputs. It's, it's really amazing. In the back. In some recent work with a rodent model of yeah. Alzheimer's disease, they developed an antibody which cleared the brains of the amyloid plaque. Presumably, it did not affect the tubulin inside their neurons. Their function was largely restored. Uh, I'm skeptical about that um, because you know every couple of years they have a new a new drug for Alzheimer's. For example, cholinergic agonists because most of the neurons involved are cholinergic. You give something that makes acetylcholine last longer, they get better marginally. So I have to see the studies. Um, but beware of claims that, that help to uh, treat Alzheimer's because there's a lot of money involved. Um, I, I would, I don't, I have to see the, I have to see the studies, but I would say just getting rid of the amyloid plaques would not, would not solve it. So this kind of seems to suggest the templating possibility that we might one day be able to develop some kind of artificial system that would plug into the brain's superposition and maybe make it so that your consciousness could migrate outwards and then be taken away? <laughs> well, maybe. But, you know, interfacing, you know, it's a quantum system. You can't interface with it. You interface with it, you destroy it. So it ha well, we do that all the time. I mean, I mean, in the, um, the other way to ask that question is, is, well, how do you interact with a quantum? How does a quantum system, which has to be isolated, have inputs and outputs? So if you go back to that, that slide I showed of the, of the wave like that, um, uh, at the bottom of the wave, it, you're in a classical phase. So you're alternating between classical quantum, classical quantum, classical quantum, classical quantum, 40 times a second. During the classical phase, you have inputs and outputs. Uh, but in that integration phase, it's strictly quantum. So you, the interactions are punctuated every 25 milliseconds. What, what, what do you think of the plausibility? Is it inherently impossible? Or, or if, in other words, if you connect it to an external system during the classical phase, and then the whole thing ran into superposition together, and the, when the superposition collapsed, your quantum, your, your mind basically would migrate out with some probability into the external device. Well, I, I think that there can be quantum entanglement between people. I think that, you know, I'm not an advocate of, of parapsychology or, or near-death experiences or things like that, but if, if they occur, and I think there's some very interesting suggestion that they do occur. The only possible explanation is some kind of quantum effect, some kind of type of quantum entanglement between people over time, space, that sort of thing. I missed a good part of this, so maybe you've already addressed it. Um, it seems a lot of this is based on the assumption that consciousness is some sort of privileged state. Um, how would you go about demonstrating that such a labelable state as consciousness even exists? So you're questioning whether consciousness exists. Yes. Um, I, you know that's hard to argue. Um, I, I, I would read David. I would recommend you read David Chalmers' book, The Puzzle of Conscious Experience, because it's be, or, or John Searle's Chinese Room argument, or any 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 number of philosophical arguments. I, I read John Searle's Chinese Room argument, and it seems to be uh, based entirely on 
someone blustering and saying, well, of course that's not consciousness. And I, I don't think they've demonstrated any such thing in the argument. <laughs> Well, I may not, I may never convince you. I would suggest you read David Chalmers' book uh, on the on the hard problem, the puzzle of conscious what experience. What falsifiable hypothesis would allow us to test? Our model has many falsifiable, uh, testable predictions and falsifiable hypotheses. Unlike AI, which has yet to produce a single testable prediction. Pardon me. Would allow us to test the existence of consciousness. Yeah, that's a good question. It seems that your model presupposes the existence of consciousness as a discrete state. I'm not, what do you mean by discrete? You mean it's something unique? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Because, it, but that, that's, that, I think any theory is gonna face, is gonna face that. But, and it, it, you can, you know, you can, you can take the Penrose girdle argument, you can take any number of arguments against what you're saying, and in the end it's, it's arguable, as I said in the, in the first problem with the singularity. So uh, you, it may be, it may not be possible to prove the existence of consciousness. But you're giving hard, equations for exactly how much energy is in consciousness, and you don't have a falsifiable hypothesis. Oh, we have many falsifiable. No, 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 no. We have, we have t I published t 20 testable predictions of our model, OK? Uh, I have yet to hear a single testable prediction or falsifiable uh, statement uh, about AI producing consciousness. Now, if you say consciousness doesn't exist, then, then there's nothing to prove anyway. And uh, so I, I really don't know how to respond to that. Would your uh, hypothesis fit in with Dean Radin's observations that the body can respond um, previous in time to a phenomenon happening on the computer? Quantum mechanics is non-local. Um, the Wheeler Delay Choice experiment that was proposed by Wheeler years ago was proven in the last couple of years. And as Alan Aspect gave a talk about this at Arizona. And I, and I said, well, does that prove that, that quantum information can go backward in time? And he said, yes, unfortunately, it does, it does prove that. So, and that, that solves the problem of, of the Libet experiments because of, of backward time referral and can also rescue us from being epiphenomenal because we can have conscious uh, decisions in real time. So, um, yeah, we'll have question. Well, there's one more over there. Should we quit? Oh, we got to quit? Oh, okay. Was there one over there? Uh, yeah, so these, this gamma synchrony stuff seems to be based on observations with humans and uh, studies done with humans who can, after, the, after being in a certain state, tell you whether they are conscious or not. But doesn't that ignore equifinality? And related to that, you, you were talking about earlier uh, paramecium's not having uh, gaps. Or yeah, having I don't think you need gamma synchrony for consciousness. As okay. I said, an electron could be conscious, but the T would be 10 million years. Gamma synchrony just, just has, happens to be where our brains work optimally. You could have, you could have conscious moments at alpha at 10 per second, um, but they would be much less intense. So uh, the, there's nothing magical about the gamma synchrony, but it's a way of, of coordinating all the quantum, quantum activities and the turbulence throughout the brain into one uh, superposition state. So it seemed, it seemed that you were implying earlier that Paramecians are conscious. No, I wasn't. I was just using them as, a, uh, uh, as an example of an intelligent behavior, adaptive behavior that doesn't have any synapses. So if you want to build a robot, uh, you know, build one without any, without any connections. Actually, a par paramecium uh, uh, by equals h over t, uh, they would have to be in uh, superposition, isolated from the environment for a couple minutes. And the only time that the paramecium are absolutely still and not moving is when they're having sex. So maybe two paramecium fused together are having a conscious moment at the end of, <laughs> which would, twice as much mass, exactly. And when you think about it, conscious experience would be a pretty good incentive for uh, evolution and procreation. So maybe par paramecium might be conscious. I don't know that they're conscious or not, but if they are, then during sex is probably the best bet for when they are conscious. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.